Welcome to Regenerative Rising, Elevating Voices, Activating Change podcast. I'm your host, Celine Diaris, and with me today is Nicole Masters, who is known as a agroecologist, systems thinker, educator, disruptor, and author. Welcome to Regenerative Rising's podcast, Nicole. I'm so excited. Thank you so much for having me on, Celine. This is a dream to speak with you. Oh, you're so, so, so kind. Well, you know, what is fabulous when I think about how our paths crossed several years ago, where we both sat on a podcast, and then ever since then, I'm like, I really need to connect with this person. She's inspiring and smart and doing such powerful work in the world. So there's this deep joy mm-hmm. for me that our paths have become more interwoven and I just am excited for where that will take us as we move Mm -hmm. along. But so today is a wonderful um, activation of two women who are really passionate about a type of change Mm -hmm. that's a systemic type of change. And I wanted to start with a quote that you've used out in the world that I find really powerful uh, because it feels really relevant to something Mm -hmm. all of us struggle with fundamentally. Doubt is not a pleasant condition, but certainty is an absurd one. Mm -hmm. I fall terror. Yeah. 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 And I, and I think if we look so much at the dysfunction of the world of, of what's not working well and what people are very concerned about so much of this comes down to this chasing control and wanting to be able to control the world around us, being able to control our own bodies, the environment um, and agricultural systems. And actually we will never have control. Um, And the the more that we can give that up, I actually think it brings a whole lot of peace and ease when we stop feeling that we have to control everything. We we can barely control ourselves mostly. (laughs) I mean, we, I think when we step back and take a genuine appreciative look at one's own life, Mm-hmm. There is no certainty, mm-hmm. none whatsoever. And in fact, the other constant is change. Yeah. And oddly, these are two things that we rally and fight against constantly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yet they are ubiquitous. They are constants in our personal journey and everything around us from the seasons to, you know, is it a sunny day? Is it a cloudy? All of these represent uncertainties Mm -hmm. and changes all around us and then our own state of being do we wake up in a good mood do we wake up (laughs) in an ungood mood you know what what we are like weather internally and we're like weather externally Mm -hmm. yeah and if you look through the agricultural lens you you see you know monocultures and pesticides and herbicides are all this desperate need to control and you know, someone, an agronomist might say to a producer, hey, you're going to put on 250 pounds of this and it's going to grow you this much yield. And it's like, that's not true. They just totally made that up because what does this season look like? And, you know, what is happening with the weather and hail and frost and, and everything else? Rainfall, my goodness. Yes. Um, and and yet we, we live in like, oh, well, there's this promise out there and no one's actually holding those people accountable <laughs> for those promises. That is so important. You know, uh, yield is another one of, well, you were just were speaking to that, like you put this much on, you're going to gain this much. And then you think about, you know, just what happened in Montana. Was it last year with all of the um, crickets or grasshoppers? grasshoppers? Absolutely phenomenal. There's an image that I share that's from um, a meteorological weather station, and it looks like rain clouds are coming and actually they are grasshoppers. (laughs) Uh, it, I had this real sensation two years ago, just driving around during the drought. I went all the way through Colorado and Wyoming and Montana, and <clears throat> it literally felt like the apocalypse. I mean, we had these huge dust storms. Then we had the smoke coming over from the east co- uh, from the west coast. Um, these huge winds that were blowing over power lines and trucks, and the ground, the road itself was covered in grasshoppers and. Um, it was slick with it. Like, it was gross. And I'm like, <laughs> wow, like this is literally happening in front of my eyes. And all of this is human induced. All of this is management. Exactly. I love that you frame it that way because 
my husband and I just drove this past August across Colorado, Utah, Nevada, and California, and were awestruck on the level of horror at the low, low, low reservoirs all across the West. And you think about agriculture being a huge water consumer, but you think Mm -hmm. about the inappropriate crops that we're growing in inappropriate places that are doing extraordinary damage to water tables. Growing corn Mm. in low water environments and then supplementing from groundwater supply, from reservoir supply, is for me the height of a kind of arrogance and hubris Mm -hmm. that we really have to bring the conversation towards that. Yeah. Well, I think it's a bigger piece in terms of, you know, crops could be using water, but crops are also part of the short water cycle. So what are we doing in terms of, of, of management, of restoration of diverse, vibrant ecosystems that actually now the water cycle is working and now the aquifer is restoring and, you know, talking to some producers who are measuring where the water table is and seeing water tables lifting, seeing soils acting like a sponge that slowly release water over time. And, you know, this apocalyptic journey I had, I then turned up at a property that had no grasshoppers, had green lush grass, um, have a policy of making sure that they have at least, you know, 18 months to three years of grass ahead of their cattle, um, the aliveness of like just the, the the insects and the birds and foxes and, and just it, it was absolutely remarkable. And I literally just wanted to sit in those fields and cry. But mm. it was this cry of of actual hope of right. like there are people doing extraordinary things around the country. And what would what would you know, what would the US, what would the planet look like if we were restoring these ecosystems and had, you know, fully functional water cycles and greenhouse gas cycles and everything Absolutely. else. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the 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 landscape calls the water. I think yes. this is something people don't really understand about how rain pull, is pulled into the interior of the country based on the aliveness mm. of what's on the ground. Yeah, and that's m- microbial, that's volatile organic compounds. There's a researcher called Milan Milan who did some work in the Mediterranean, and they found that 80% of the rainfall in the Mediterranean basin came from within the basin. So 80% of all that precipitation and everything is actually in that in that region. So uh, practicing, you know, if you are overgrazing and creating bare soil, if you're practicing what we call um, like chemical fallow or bare fallow, those practices are actually a social injustice to your neighbors because you are taking away their water through degrading your landscape. And also what it does is it lifts the atmospheric boundary by about 800 meters they showed in um Saskatchewan and Montana, is this practice of spraying all your fields out, so some are fallow, so they have nothing growing because apparently it saves water, is you are reducing the the rainfall for everybody else. Wow. Wow. Mm. I I just have to say wow, because I think to ponder that for a moment around kind of going back to where we began around how much we are having an effect. Mm. And thereby, the other side of that is we can have an effect that's an affirming effect, that's a life restorative effect. And so we can be a destructive species or we can be a constructive species. We can regenerate or degenerate. And what's so powerful to what you're sharing, like we actually have evidence, which lots of people want. We also have, you know, the capacity to observe Mm -hmm. and and take note of systemic evolution of place when you apply a different set of practices, holistic Mm -hmm. land management with grazing, changing crop rotations and, and companion planting and cover cropping and all sorts of, you know, bringing in agroforestry practices that are uplifting to land and place. The list is very long and the outcomes are really very uplifting and give us a lot of potential 
opportunity to make things right sooner than we tend mm. to give ourselves credit for. Yeah. And I had a I had a case this year that has absolutely blown my mind in terms of how quickly we could turn around degraded landscapes. Um, we're talking about an environment that was growing nothing and had grown nothing for 10 years. And this is their most productive irrigated hay fields. Um, and that system had totally fallen apart. And yet how quickly they could reboot that and we could see soil systems starting to restore um, has really made me reflect on how quickly we can shift this. And often I think as humans, we don't even realize how quick some of these tipping points are and what we're seeing in terms of uptake in some regions is, is phenomenal. And it's happening from the ground up and it's happening through people really thinking that it's almost like the question of what can I do today to be in service of nature? What can I do to be in service of the landscape instead of what can I extract and exploit and pull off and um, just be here for a good time, not a long time? <laughs> exactly. Well, to me, coming back over and over to something I know you, I sh you and I share in common is as systems thinkers, it's really how you frame your inquiry. Because if you mm -hmm. frame a question in a way that produces a narrow type of outcome versus framing a query that opens to a much broader potential considering, then where you go from that is so massively different. And if you're not in a systems orientation where you're looking at the complexity of place and considering all of the interstitial relationships that are represented in place and taking that kind of approach to whatever place you find yourself without that type of framing. That's what concerns me is if we don't have that more widely adopted, then yeah. we're going to keep using the same thinking that's brought us to the brink. And, and I think this thinking really reflects what's happening in, on the ground in terms of we have a monoculture of the mind. We have people that have lost their ability to think adaptively and creatively. And there's a there's a lot of reasons for that. And part of that is stress. So, you, you know, a lot of producers that I come across and, and thinking about what was happening in Montana and Colorado, they are in a highly sympathetic nervous system space, which means you're in flight or fight. There's a whole hormonal cascade that happens that actually affects the, the, the body will send blood to the extremities so you can run. It's not sending blood to the brain to help you creatively think. And until we kind of address some of these underlying systems that are, that are increasing stress on producers, then I think we're going to see a drag in their ability to, to think creatively. And it's why when I design workshops or I'm working with clients, we very much look at how do we sink into the parasympathetic state, which is that that space of gratitude, that space of hope or, you know, what would be possible if we had a magic wand? What would this look like? What would this feel like? And really designing programs that help us shift into that nervous system because now we can start to think clearly. Now the, the body will actually send blood back to the brain. Um, but what I'm seeing in most regions is people are so stressed. I mean, I look at the suicide rate here in Montana, and it's twice that of what it is in Australia and New Zealand, yet we have these huge campaigns for mental health and well-being in Australia and New Zealand. And here it's like this dirty secret that we're not going to talk about. And I think that's the benefit of being a traveler is you kind of get to see, hey, uh, you know, this isn't normal. <laughs> right. Hello. No, I, that's so powerful. I love that you started with the human as you know, kind of at a very important inflection point in an ecosystem process, because if the people are so overwrought, mm -hmm. and then as you say, I mean, what our physical systems do to, to protect us from that doesn't necessarily line up with what we really need to be capable of step showing up as. So I, I, I really appreciate you for how you're so sensitive to that and the way that you work. Um, because obviously we are central to our own healing potential. And if we ourselves are in a state of unease, then how do we generate from that place in a way that's really inspired and wise and thoughtful? And so what we're seeing right now, you see the amount of money that the 
the government here in the US released for the Climate Smart pro projects is funding money into, here's some practices that you can do. And all of this is, it's change, right? It's, none of it's transformation. None of it's really thinking, you know, every single one of these practices could be degenerative. Like just because you're planting a cover crop doesn't mean you're regenerating. I'm sorry. That might be shocking for some people. Um, but we need to be thinking, how does this work in a system? What's happening with your timing? Um, how does this relate to the whole ecosystem instead of, well, I did a cover crop and so therefore I'm regenerative and I should get some kind of credits. Um, and I think that's the biggest missing. And I do think that that is where we are evolving as a species. And we're seeing this in education and health and on landscape management is we need to be dealing with this deeper underlying systemic thinking and, and move away from the world of separation and move away from that, um, I don't know, it's like a prescription here. Here's that silver bullet you were looking for. Now you're, now you're regenerative. Exactly. Well, you know, it's a long, long pattern of how we've oriented with the human at the top of the pyramid and everything below. And really, um, a, a, t a talk I just attended with Robin Wall Kimmerer, the author of Braiding Sweetgrass, she put up, you know, this, this, triangle and at the top was man and on the next level was woman and then another creature and on down and you know she showed us another image that was a circle with all the species man and woman everybody in sort of parity with one another because what's true and as you know very well from the kind of work that you do you know those microbes in the soil are as essential to the health of the people in the land as a good farmer is to the health of the of the land and the people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and that's I think this not is how we're trained to think, Nicole, as you know. And it's like, oh. how do we get from this, you know, human centric separation motif idea where, you know, I love in native tradition, everything is your relative. And I, I instinctively orient that way. I've just been in mm -hmm. love with the world ever since I was a little girl. And I've just always seen it as this aliveness, but I'm not typical in that no. sense. <laughs> No, and, and 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 certainly if I think of the agricultural context, there was something wrong or woo-woo if you talked about feelings or if you talked about feeling connected or if you were like this one rancher was excited to see foxes. It's like that was wrong. That was bad. We shouldn't talk about emotions. And it's like, well, the consequence of that is not only are we separated from the ecosystem, we're separated from ourselves. So I meet producers who don't even realize that they're breathing like hyperventilating because they only breathe here. They're not. And so I'm, I'm saying, can we feel connected to a landscape? And I'm like, oh, actually, can we, can we just step back? Because you're totally disconnected from your own body. Mm. And um, I I feel like I used to not be able to talk about things like that. And now I'm like, we have to be talking about this stuff. You've got to breathe. You've got to breathe right down into the bottom of your lungs because you're holding all this stress, all right? And then that's affecting your ability to think and, and deal with your family. And, and actually, you're probably never going to be happy and you're never going to be fulfilled and you're never going to be successful or profitable because... Those things can't happen until you connect yourself. Right. I think, you know, when I started doing the work I'm doing and, you know, I was I began thinking I wanted to be changing large systems and that that would filter down to the people. And then I had a Satori. This is when I was in my 20s. And I realized, no, the true path for the type of systemic transformational change that I was hungry to see happen in the world has to start with each person. Because it's only through our own kind of revelation within ourselves about how we create a more whole and complete experience of being alive and finding our own joy just through our presence, our essence, and not requiring external things to satisfy the joy mm -hmm. of being alive. And then you think if everybody on the planet felt that way. Whew. how many of these big problems would just yeah. disappear. Like, they would. It would it, be, it, that's the miracle I'm hoping for. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, it's why we designed the CREATE program. So we have a 20-week long transformative train the trainers school in, and we promise people you are not going to be the same person that leaves the school that, that starts because we really are going to be looking at what are these assumptions? What is it that your culture says this is the way it should be? Like asking these why questions about the world around us and our internal world and to keep delving into you know, why do I, why do I feel this way? Do I, why do I think this way? Is that even true? And most of what we think is a construct that we've, you know, been pushed by the media or pushed through schools or whatever those systems are. And, and to really to start to be able to critically think and to be able to have conversations with people who might disagree with you. I think we've lost these social skills that are so important. hundred percent. And it's, It is vital that we be able to hear a different perspective Mm -hmm. and not immediately defend or fight, but Mm -hmm. be curious, you know, Mm -hmm. why do you perceive things that way? Because when you stop and really, and I love that you're talking about that kind of critical thinking and self-reflection and asking, being curious about your own beliefs. Why do you think things are as you think they are? And have you ever examined those things. And that can be a really upending experience for someone Mm -hmm. to go through. I know I certainly went through that being raised in a very conservative context and then never quite feeling that was right. And then through my life, parsing a different frame for how I approach my worldview being I would call, you know, a living systems worldview or an indigenous worldview where I see everything is alive, everything is interconnected. And therefore, there is no way to sort of break things down into their various parts and make choices based on that, because then you've really eliminated this massive complexity. So what was it that enabled you to do that, do you think? Well, that's a great question. I I know I came into this life really curious And I also know, I just knew that there was watching outside systems be incongruent with the religious stories I was being told were the beginning for me. Yeah. Yeah. And and seeing that inequity played out and, and biases played out and not finding that in alignment with the original voice of, Mm -hmm. you know, I was raised in a Christian tradition that just started to trouble me Mm. from a very early age. And that I think set things in motion as I went along and I kept digging deeper and I, I got to go to a mystery school (laughs) in uh, Baltimore (laughs) and study the perennial wisdom. So I really deviated from that original path, but a lot of people don't. And a lot of people don't natively want to disrupt Mm -hmm. their reality. So when you talk, you know, when you think of yourself as a disruptor, your comfort level Mm -hmm. with breaking up those knotted cohesions Mm -hmm. and being willing to put some energy to move things into a different pattern. I mean, it just isn't what most people seek out. No. And I sometimes I think, gosh, it would be nice to be be comfortable just being comfortable but there's some there's something about that slight discomfort that I, I seek it I'm interested in that and I'm interested in why something might make me feel uncomfortable um or why someone else feels uncomfortable uh but I think there's a cost there's a really big cost for people that are unwilling to be uncomfortable because that's where we learn that's where and, and again this comes back to the that starting comment thinking about control is we think if we stay comfortable that we can control things and it's like you can't and you know next thing you know you've got some kind of cancer or you've got children with all these learning disorders and it's like at some point we need to get uncomfortable because we need to be asking the question of what do you, what do we eat what what are we putting in just in our environment in the house um you know that that whole picture is actually a cost because now there's going to be some kind of secondary fallout. There's going to be an unintended consequence of trying to think you can live your life small. Well, I just want to comment to that because I did that. I 
for a very long time, you know, I have a, I have an externally what looks like a very expressive, productive life. And that's true. But there was a whole aspect of me that I was repressing and I did get cancer. And when I was diagnosed with cancer leading up to that, I'd had this kind of insight that I was repressing a lot of my life force just to be smaller, more acceptable, just to make sure everybody would like me. You know, that was the frame. It wasn't truth, but it was certainly the way I'd been conditioned to think. And when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, that was like the big insight for me was that tumor was the symbol of the repression of so much of my life force. And so thankfully I'm here to tell the tale and I'm healthy. And I think it's unleashed something in me that's more willing to be even more out with what I really see and feel and note, whether I'm right or wrong is up to, you know, someone else's opinion, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But I think being courageous to be a disruptor to, you know, I was in a meeting recently and they, there was a farmer on the call and they were talking about the, the, what we grow in the U S I said, you know, we grow commodity crops. Mm -hmm. I, I would venture to say the amount of food that we grow in this country is a very small percentage of what we're doing with all of this farmland. Mm, yeah. And that to me has to become part of the conversation because it's, it's like this, el this illusory remark where you say, well, the American farmer is growing the food of the world. I'm like, no, they're not. <laughs> no, we're not. We're not growing food. We're mm -hmm. growing commodity crops and we've been growing commodity crops since this country began on the back of slaves. Yeah. And it's never really evolved much beyond that. You can be thankful for California and a few other places. And then where you are locally, like I'm a member of a local farm as a CSA and we weather the weather with them. And, you know, we've had different, very different seasons here in terms of what we get in our um, monthly or weekly supply, just based on what succeeded and failed under mm -hmm. the direct conditions. So yeah. it's a real problem in my mind that we're not having that conversation. No, and it was, I think this is one of the things that COVID brought forth and I hope maintains is seeing some of these food production areas are actually classified as food deserts. So working with friends of mine that are Lakota in um, South Dakota, who were like COVID hit and they had nothing. They had nothing to eat. And even the meat, like the beef that's growing on the reservation is all exported onto that commodity market. They're not supplying any of that for local food. Um, and it's like, how is it we have these communities, we have all this land, and actually there is no food. There's just no food. So seeing um, greenhouses being built and people now direct marketing to their own communities is just been phenomenal to see. Mm. But it's like corn and soy and corn and soy, that's that's not food for humans. It's food for, you know, processed foods and feedlots, but it's certainly not what's sustaining um, human nutrition. And, and I think this is the challenge of looking at how do we create regenerative food systems when you're still doing it from within the degenerative, exploitative, monocultural commodity market. <laughs> I mean, commodity markets. And it's like, how do you go around that? Because we've got to go around it because the whole system is not set up for farmers to be successful. Um, they're not getting paid. They're just, they are literally not getting paid. And everyone's like, well, that means that food will become more expensive. No, we need to cut all that middlemen junk out of this system. And, and until that kind of shifts, and, and that's a challenge. If you are in North Dakota and you're growing um, maybe not corn and soy, but, you know, you grow some kind of commodity crops and then it's like, how do you get out of that system? And what's interesting is, you know, to make a profit, some of these guys have to be like 10,000 acres in size and it's like, could you be 1,000 acres and be doing all of these diversity of crops and actually direct to market and getting paid for the quality that you're producing and then maybe you don't need all of that land? Right. Um, 
And that's an interesting conversation to have with some of those It guys. is another conversation to have. And it means like, I have no answers. I mean, I'm not even pretending to have an answer, but I am saying it's a really vital inquiry that I think we need to have broadly to think about, you know, you add to this, the lack of wildlife corridors and the pressures of wildlife declining everywhere. And this issue of food not being consumed locally and being shipped off happens in a lot of parts of the world. Yeah. So it's not even, it's not unique, unfortunately. So I think given the sort of the systemicness of this larger pattern of agriculture and this larger pattern pattern of, you know, exporting out food and leaving the dredge for what's there locally is also it's wackadoodle. I mean, it's just, it's not, it's almost like an insanity that we've all bought into and we're all wondering why things are so messed up, but we're not willing to sort of, you know, address this deep systemic faultiness of a design that's only meant to enrich a small percentage and it isn't in service to deep shared well-being for all life Mm-mm, no and and i think that's why i'm more interested in the educational side of things i've never really been interested in top down i'm not very um I'm not very tactful in those kind of meetings i'm not <laughs> made for those kind of meetings i don't um, know i'm thinking disruptorness may we may need to be oh, in one of those no, meetings I'm very disruptive. i i might throw toys but um is is we need to be educating ourselves in, in the, and I think the educational system, the academic systems, all of these need to be part of this disruption. And so it, I find, you know, I meet a lot of people who feel really overwhelmed, right? We, and we're going to be overwhelmed about climate change or biodiversity collapses or acidification of the ocean. You choose your poison, right? <laughs> um, exactly. And I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm not interested in kind of, wading down these pathways of there's a whole lot of things I can't change. I can't currently change the commodity system, but what I can do is plant seeds and work with people who themselves can, can start to think innovatively because I don't have the answers. I don't know what that looks like. Um, I don't know how it's going to work for an individual, but how do we empower individuals that then like one of, one of the people that I really love working with is what we call the opinion leaders. So people that, are very well respected in their communities, they start to shift and big things start to happen. And one example is here in Big Timber in Montana. Um, a rancher, the ranching family I started working with in 2013, um, They we, we got out a map the other day and we looked at a 10 kilometer radius and within that 10 kilometer radius, 50% of the land area is now running regenerative, adaptive grazing, holistic management, whatever that is. And I'm not just saying it was just this one family, but it kind of was, you know, that that they are, you know, they're on the Cattlemen's Association, they're Republicans, they are, you know, good ranching family and what they're doing makes so much sense. Like soil health is not political. You can't argue with it because you don't believe in soil health. Okay. If you don't believe in soil health, um, yeah, you, you need to be rethinking your whole worldview, I think. But um <laughs> Is is the buy-in is is incredible within communities, and those communities can now look at can we do things cooperatively? So cooperatively, they are bringing in fertilizer, for instance. Cooperatively, they could be, um, you know, distributing meat direct to market, whatever that looks like. Um, but it's got to come from within the community. I'm going to just give a little station break ID of you're listening to Regenerative Rising's Elevating Voices, Activating Change. I'm your host, Celine Diaris, and with me today is Nicole Masters. Nicole, what you were just saying about, you know, soil is kind of this ubiquitous, ubiquitous presence underneath our feet all over the earth. It's the skin of the planet. It's where life happens. The everything that we sort of enjoy is thanks to the amazing life of soil. Mm-hmm. And when we stop seeing that kind of vi- vitality, it's easy to say, well, there is a way in which we've not been relating to soil as a living 
substrate. It's a living presence. It's not just this inert material mm. that I think a lot of folks, you know, have disparaged and not understood. And I mean, you know, on some level, it's like, wow, that's a lot of failed observational uh, <laughs> presence. But I mean, it's kind of back into how we get schooled into mm-hmm. thinking and how we get schooled into perception and how we get schooled into belief systems. And that this is something that can rise above all of those different partitions and become a unifying understanding that it, it's true no matter what your walk of life is. This is real. Okay. This, is, this is very powerful and genuine. Yeah. And it's kind of interesting. So I did my degree soil science 24 years ago. And, you know, the the textbooks like that big, um, no one mentioned that soil was living in that degree. And if you look at the textbook, there's only four pages on microbiology. And so that was 24 years ago. That textbook is still the textbook at the universities. (laughs) And I'm like, oh my goodness, that's sad. It's very sad. But then you think about the gut microbiome, you know, so much of that really is is taking off in the last decade. Yeah. Um, this idea of the hollow biome that actually you are not a single organism. I mean, we have more bacterial cells than we have human cells in our bodies. Um, is who's dictating your mood, who's dictating what you're craving um, is and your health. I mean, 100% of immunological disorders come from the gut microbiome. And that is all really new. And so I think people not appreciating the aliveness of soil, it's probably not surprising, Um, you know, and and I'm always ribbing people for calling it dirt. And it's like, you know, dirt's what's underneath your fingernails. But, you know, we need to shift away from this idea that this is something inert, that this is a resource that's never going to run out because, uh, we're seeing areas that have lost 30 to 60% of their soil in the last 100 years, 120 years. And there's a cost for that, you know, Absolutely. like, yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I want to lean in a little bit into um, something that excited me that I saw you had done when I was looking at some Instagram posts uh, that you did some work in England. Mm. And I was curious if you could share a little bit about the work with the Spencer family and at Althorpe and and just share how you said that came together really quickly. But suddenly you had over 100 people who are tenant farmers or associated with, I don't need to tell the story. I really want you to <laughs> share uh, this amazing story of, of a genuine commitment to transformation. It was, it was, so, it was so extraordinary. So I'm not taking on one-on-one clients. I just, I've got too busy and I'm also looking at where can I, you know, leverage impact. And that was around the education. So when they reached out, I, one, I didn't know who it was. Um, and I'm like, yeah, I'm just too busy. And my mum was leaping around in the background. Like, <laughs> do, you know, do you know who that is? I'm like, no. And so um, I had to call them back because I went and did some thinking. So Althorpe is Lady Diana Spencer's ancestral home, you know, and it's been in the Spencer family for over 500 years. Um, And so working with Karen Spencer is extraordinary because you're seeing these people who have not – realize what's going on with their own land you know they they have other people that manage the land there's other people that uh, the tenant farmers that might be grazing or cropping and the actual estate owners and it seems like across the UK are oblivious to what's going on in in this landscape and now they're going well why is it that you've been spraying herbicides for 50 years and they actually had someone come and visit all thought um, to the actual estates about 12,000 acres, an hour and a half North of London. So we're talking about, you know, a substantial land holding um, is this guy had been working on the property in the fifties. And he said, there is the same amount of weeds here today as there was, you know, 60 years ago. Um, <laughs> even though you've been using, you know, tord on and graze on for that 60 year period, but what they've lost is all their forbs. So there's no legumes, there's no native flowering plants. There's just grass. Wow. Um, and, and what you're seeing then is the dieback of trees, 
Um, obviously, that's going to impact the quality of what animals have to choose from. So, you know, potentially you're going to see animal health problems when people do that. But that are half the Karen in terms of we've been doing all of this and we're no further ahead. Like herbicides have never exterminated a single plant in, in the world. So these guys were like, hey, we, can you come to London? I'm like, well, the only window I've got is in three weeks. Well, let's make it happen. Three weeks. We'll, we'll do an, an event at, at the estate. I said, well, no one's going to come. People don't know me. And they're like, look, trust us. You've got a fan club with the book and, and all of that. They got 160 people within three weeks. We asked we surveyed them in terms of who's in the room and 80% of people replied to that survey and there were 160,000 acres represented just by half of that group. Now, most landholding in the UK is, you know, 250 acres, maybe 1,000 acres, so very small landholders. So what it showed us was there were some very big players in the room asking the question of, how do we build soil health? How do we restore ecosystem function? There were a lot of water companies, with it, which I thought was really interesting because the water companies like, we are spending millions of dollars cleaning up water when it's all about what's happening on the land. This flash flood drought cycle is all about land management. Um, can we start to invest in landowners for them to build the infrastructure so we're not having to clean up waterways or repair, you know, levees and dams and bridges. Like what wow. would that look like? And so it was it was just really cool. It was such a neat mix of people. And I had two days of feeling like I was literally a rock star because like they were <laughs> they were so pumped. Like the room was like, it was like I've never had I love an experience. It. it was it was it was very cool. I'm like an yeah, agroecologist equals rock star. Yeah, yeah. Now yeah. you know we're moving in the right direction, sister. <laughs> oh, God. It, it, it was uh, quite, it was extraordinary. It and was they've extraordinary. made a commitment to totally transforming the entire landscape that's under their management. I saw that they reintroduced a type of cattle that was on the property 300 years ago. Yeah, so they were one of the original registered shorthorn breeders in the UK. And you know, they haven't been owning their own animals. So they're, they're now looking at bringing, sh they brought shorthorn back. Uh, they went certified organic and it was more just to stop the continual arguments that they were having. So um, one of their, the, the head farm manager, um, we went out in the field for a few days and I could tell he wasn't happy. Like he just, he wasn't happy. He didn't, he didn't listen. I'm like, okay. And so he came to the two day workshop and at the end of it, he came up to me and he said, when we went certified organic, I lost every single one of my tools. I said, I didn't know how to farm organically. I didn't know what I could do. And he said, now my toolbox is full again. I want to tell you, this has been transformative. And I'm so excited. And I was like, oh, just my heart would sing. And it was like, even if it was just that one guy to have that impact on him was just amazing. Well, I think what you just shared is the state of affairs for so many people who have been in farming systems that have gone the chemical route for a long time. And there is genuinely a lack of knowing yeah. of what's my toolkit now? I don't even have a toolkit. And that is a very frightening place to be when your livelihood is on the line. So I love that you had that encounter because to me, that person represents the feelings of thousands of other conventional farmers who have been reliant on these chemical promises hmm. and they don't have the knowledge that maybe their forebearers had yeah, yeah and, I, and I think um there there's these myths that are being perpetuated by the chemical industry which is that one um regenerative agriculture is going to cost you a lot money more money if you start looking after your soil health it's going to be like seven years before you make a profit and there's some really good research in this country, too, to show that on average, regenerative producers are about 78% more profitable than their conventional compadres. And my approach very much is, I, we call it the methadone program, don't tell anybody, <laughs> is like, how do we slowly wean a system off? Because you have a chemically addicted system, you can't, you can pull the plug. And, and I think if you do that, that's where people see 
you know, reductions in yields or insect pests and all of that. But if we do this very thoughtfully and carefully in terms of restoring that soil gut microbiome, getting nutrition up, bringing back, you know, beneficial insects and seeing all of this piece, there's no reason for that to be less profitable. Um, and I do think that it is that is a myth that's being pushed out there just to deter people from looking at it. Well, of course, mm. they're... they're- profitability is based on this level of dependency. Yeah. And I think one of the things I've thought a lot about is how do we bring them into this conversation? Because those companies don't see where they fit in Mm -hmm. that future paradigm. So there has to be um, a way that we can cooperate so that there's a transition that can happen inside of these industries that are making a lot of money that are doing an inordinate amount of damage and not being held oh. to account for all of those und- uh, maybe unintended consequences. But nevertheless, they're very real, including, yeah. you know, cancers and humans and animals because of all of this stuff. So I don't, again, that's just a question. I don't have an answer. I don't expect you to have an answer, but I, I do think it's an interesting opportunity. It is, and we certainly are seeing a lot of these big agri-chemicals offering, you know, biological wings to to the products that they have. Um, you know, the 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 biofertilizer industry itself is just growing exponentially. I think it's up to like one point six. No, I'll be making numbers up. Um, but yeah, the, <laughs> just seeing an extraordinary lift in in the size of that industry. Um, and so like Bayer just came out with a herbicide that increases your soil carbon. How marvelous. You know, so yeah. <laughs> they're not silly. They can see the market trends and signals. They will find products that will we'll, we'll keep them in business. And I, I don't, I'm not resentful about that at all. Um I think what's exciting is for there's certain producers that that's going to work really well for. And then others are like, well, you know, you can make this stuff yourself. So do you want to do that? Yes. Well, you know, and I think we're at this interesting moment. You mentioned the USDA's 2.4 billion investment in climate smart agriculture. Huge chunks of that went to the big status quo players, which was a little distressing and, but I know my organization participated also in those um, applications, and we are part of two groups that were funded. And so it gives me hope <laughs> that some of what I would say are the true change makers who are definitely aiming toward this more holistic transformation around how do we relate to what's possible when it comes to agriculture. And it's really about that, you know, do, can we step into this circle together and be asking ourselves a new set of questions? Are we willing to ask ourselves, are we happy with where we are? Are there, is there a potential for something greater? And when you think about the tenacity of life as your Mm co-pilot, that's a heck of an ally to have because Life wants to happen. And as you're saying, when you see these places that have been under a new type of management and how the system responds, that's what I always remind people. It's like, this is not like a slow moving train. What's powerful is like the kind of fecundity that we're talking about, the kind of generative potential. It's, it's, it's extraordinary because this this is designed to be alive. Yeah. Yeah. And I think thinking about the businesses and the corporations, like how do we design businesses regeneratively? How do we design that in the model of nature? And a big part of this is not feeling that scarcity piece, not feeling that like we've got to be highly, highly competitive instead. How do we collaborate? How do we interrelate? And I, um, I'm just not a big fan of the us and them thing. You know, I think that these big companies are coming on board and they're going to greenwash or whitewash (laughs) the whole system. Um, And that's not kind of for for me to be saying that that is right or wrong. What, yeah, what I'm interested in is how do we, I, I feel like once you catch that soil bug, there's no uncatching it. Right. So if we can make soil health and, 
ecosystem function contagious by feeling like we can speak up, um, feeling like we can share this information, then that's where the change happens. And and I I think that's the power of people is, is we can shift the system really fast, but it's going to take some courageousness because peer pressure, or we call it the social squeeze, is the most powerful factor in agriculture. So that mm. willingness to speak and to share is so essential and so needed right now. Right. And I think, you know, a lot of farmers who have, I can speak to a few colleagues that have been doing organic agriculture for 30 some odd years, they're Mm -hmm. saying only in the recent like decade have they had people start to be interested in what they're doing for a long time. They were the oddballs, weirdos, like just not, not in the club anymore. And what they're experiencing now is like just be with the rise of this conversation around soil suddenly getting its day that their vibrancy of their landscapes are now becoming an attractor for their, their peers to start to ask the question, you know, what is it that you're doing over there? Because you're, you're maintaining much better productivity during these now very wild swings in rain, no rain, crazy storms, and you're sustaining better than we are. Yeah. Yeah. I think in some ways it's a shame that if if the system was working fine and, you know, the climate was reliable and all of this piece, I don't think we would be getting the inquiry that we're getting. And I think that openness is because actually we can't afford not to change. Um, and it was interesting talking to some of my Western Australian friends who were saying that they're having some really good seasons in um, Western Australia right now. They're getting rainfall and people are growing good crops and people that were changing their system, and I say changing, um, to more regenerative approaches have gone back onto the chemical treadmill because they're going to make a lot more money. They're going to you know, grow these bumper crops. And it's like there's a missing in there if you don't really get the, you know, I think in some ways we're just very short sighted, you know, you get of course we are. Forget what the last 10 years has been like. Um, and so I think that's, that's a big piece of the training and the mindset. I think that's an interesting observe, you know, that's an interesting risk. You know, you have a few, like here in Colorado, we've had sustained drought in the Southern part of Colorado for 18 years The rainfall where I am in the foothills has been very erratic. The pattern's been changing for the last 20 years. But like you say, you have a couple of good years and everybody just reverts back to old patterns. So it's like, how do we create this as a genuine transformational? Because that's why I was saying before, it has to be a genuine change at the individual level. It can't just be moving the chairs around on the Titanic and, oh, well, that made sense this year, but this year it looks like it's a different kind of year. I'm going to go back to what I did before. And unfortunately, this is such a longer term type of investment that we're trying to get people to think really in terms of generations instead of quarters and a single lifetime. I think that's one of the challenges of the human is our lives are short in the span of time. Yeah. So we have a hard time being invested and caring about what our great, great grandchildren's realities are going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And unfortunately that kind of selfish myopic perceiving Mm -hmm. creates a very awful trajectory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know how we change that, but that's got to shift. Well, it's part of, you know, being able to work with people to really look at what's what's the impact of that. And what are you really committed to? And people will say, oh, I'm committed to all these things that they think other people want to hear. But it's like your world shows up as your commitments. So I can see what you're committed to by the state of your barn and how you don't spend any time with your family and you haven't taken a vacation for 30 years. And, you know, those are your commitments. Um, And then what's the cost of that? And, you know, the cost is actually you're miserable or you're drinking or whatever it is that you do to sedate that. And it's like, Mm. really, is that what you really, really want? And sometimes I think we just need a, we need a mirror. We need a soundboard with someone to bounce those ideas around. And, you know, I was talking 
with people that are uh, enrolling in our coaches school and most people have no relationship with a coach there are any relationships at you know like a game of soft football or whatever you call it. <laughs> um, and that's it and it's like actually we all need it we all need a coach we all need that person to 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 soundboard off so that we can see something we hadn't seen before the things that are in our blind spots because I don't think the in the land degradation is intentional like it's a it's a side effect it's not hey I'm actually going to go out and exploit everything I can absolutely no, I agree with you. I, it's not like people wake up with ill intention. They just wake up maybe with some less well-formed understanding of the interconnectedness of everything. And if you don't have that sort of lens where you're seeing, if I do this over here, I'm changing the entire way water is going to flow on this mm-hmm. landscape. And what are the consequences of that? Is that going to be a good thing or is that going to create new challenges? And because we're not used to thinking in that sense of the relationships between things, it leaves us very vulnerable to this kind of um, the accumulation of those many, many kind of uninformed behaviors and actions having that cumulative effect that's not so pretty. Mm. And I also think, you know, when you get into the whole notion of like ownership, when someone thinks they own the land and that they can do what they want, that's another interesting challenge Mm -hmm. for shifting attitude towards, you know, this land will be here so beyond your short relationship to it. So are you going to be in a caring and, you know, stewarding for its highest good type of relationship? Or are you in an extractive, getting what you can from it kind of relationship? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think part of my joy in life is trying to find these aha moments, these disruptive moments that actually set someone on their heels like I I love it I live off that like so you know even sometimes just digging a hole with somebody and then let's say in the middle of a field and then we go and dig it in an area that hasn't been disturbed and to see that light come on in terms of you mean I've been responsible for this because I think a lot of it is the unseen, the invisible and the things that we can ignore because we're so busy dealing with urgency and crisis and right there's not that time for that deep thinking of if I keep going down this track, what am I leaving to my kids? Because if you ask most farmers, all ranches I can think of, they believe deeply that they're stewards. I think 87% when they did a national survey believe that they're stewards and that they're handing something on in better shape to their kids. And now they find kids don't even want to come back because it looks so miserable. But, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. That, that that impact moment in terms of you mean I've been responsible for this. And sometimes I'm like, well, maybe not you. Maybe it was your great grandparents. But there's been this cycle <clears throat> that's a that's a vicious downwards cycle that has led to this situation right now. And we can turn this ship around. But um, I think getting finding that that thing that just impacts people so emotionally is so important. I love that you do what you do the way that you do it, Nicole. I I just so appreciate the hands-on, on the land, with people, with the heartfulness that you bring to it, because you're seeking to create a new relationship for them, for them to have a new context for themselves, because you understand rightly that it's only through their genuine reset that that kind of sustained pattern change will be possible. Yeah. Yeah. And I say it's probably half of my formal studies have been an an equivalence in in behavioral change as it is in soil science, because I I don't believe we can separate agriculture from the cultural piece, you know, yeah, duh. Um, But there's very, very little research and work happening in this space and I do think it's the most important piece and and it's it's really really fun it is well and it is the most it's back to who is it we're trying to affect it's Mm. the human being and our relationship with how we're showing up and how we're perceiving and how we're asking 
better questions. Because to me, it's really how good are our questions? It's not as much about the answer as it's, do you have a really good way that you're framing the question? Because if you ask a, a good question, then you're opening up the possibility for some very insightful thinking. Yeah. But and it, with- it's so it's so fun and it's such an art. And I think we, we're not trained very well in society or in school and in, in how to ask a good question. But if I can share an example of this, I had a, a cropping client that I was working with. And he said, every time I'm with you, I get a headache. And, and he said, I'm, <laughs> my great thanks. And uh, he said, I'm too old for this. And I said, dude, you're my age. What, what? And it's interesting. And I said, I said to him, well, tell me about these times that you get headaches. And he's like, well, yeah, I mean, I guess I get a headache in the morning and <clears throat> yeah, when I'm under pressure and I went, okay, great. Well, the next day he comes back to me and he says, he says, I think actually what this, what, what the problem is, is that I'm drinking. And he said, I told you that, that my, that what I was committed to was spending time with my kids. And he said, but everything I do is so I don't spend time with my kids. When I get home, I go to the barn and I drink. And I was like, okay. So I didn't have to ask I mean, all I did was be that mirror, that reflection of for him to to be asking those questions of himself. And and I went off and and I actually haven't seen him since, but that was five years ago. And from what I hear through the rumor mill is that he hasn't had a drink for five years. Wow. That that one moment of reflection, he saw what he was doing was everything that he wasn't committed to. It was like the opposite of what he wanted in his life. And, and that's... Not what he wanted, but he hadn't actually had that moment to to just reflect. And for me, it was so powerful and just I don't have to have the right answers. I don't even have to ask the most brilliant magical question ever. I just have to reflect back and reflect what I'm hearing to somebody so that they get that moment to see, oh, hang on. And, yeah, it, it was because I used to be concerned about getting it right. You know, I'm going to have the perfect question or, you know, am I going to screw this up or I'm going to be tactless or I'm going to ask something, someone that's inappropriate, which I do. Now I have to apologize. Um, <laughs> but I've, I've just given myself the freedom now of whatever that question is. That was the perfect question. I'm gonna right on. Be- right on. Yeah. Um, I want to give you an opportunity to sort of share what you're thinking for the coming year, here we are, it's almost the end of 2022. Um, 2023 is just right around in a few days. What's um, What's got you sparkling about the upcoming year? I got some very big news. So uh, in 2015, I sold my own farm and I've been just living in a trailer and traveling and living with ranchers and farmers which I love, but at the same time, it feels like part of, like I'm I'm being a hypocrite because I'm talking about land management and I'm not managing even, a, well, I've got a couple of plants in, in pots, but that's about it, you know. So um, I've just, as of this week, in the middle of closing on a property in the Paradise Valley. And, yeah, so I think this year is very much just going to get back to my roots uh-huh. and, uh-huh. Um, you know, setting up a, we're calling it the soil centric learning lab that this space for, for to be rolling out just smaller introductory workshops some practical stuff, you know, on how do we bio prime seeds or, um, you know, how do we build a fence? I'm going to get some people to come and help me build some fences. Um, but <laughs> yeah, just it's such an important piece to me is the animals and, and the landscape and going, I, you know, I have been regenerating and working with people on their properties and bringing back life, and that's fantastic. And I also want to feel like I'm doing a piece of that practically with my own hands. And the exciting thing about being in Paradise Valley is that that is the main corridor into Yellowstone National Park. It's this, it was the second most biodiverse grassland in the world after the Serengeti. And we're I'm right on the main highway and it's like can we start planting these seeds with some of these very large landowners and many of their absentee landowners of what would it look like if we had that corridor restored which I know is terrifying for people but you know what would it look like to have native plants all through here and native pollinators coming back and 
you know, gosh, gosh forbid if the wolves and bison were to get out of the park. But, you know, what, what would that look like? How extraordinary could that be? And I think people don't realise when they're driving into the park what they're driving through. Um, you know, you can see these from satellite imagery and the, the soil itself there is phenomenal because you've had multiple tribes, the bison, animals moving up and down that corridor for the last 10,500 years. So I'm, I'm quite uh, excited to be there. That is so awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Well, I definitely want to come up and um, come up. I'm not going to be much of a fence builder, but I'll, I'd be <laughs> happy to help do something fun with you. On oh yeah. Plan. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll do some think tank things for sure. And um, yeah, I think just having space for community and. Well, maybe sure. that, that women gathering we talked a little bit about before we could do something on the land as ceremony. And um, I think the more we can come together in person these days and also with that deeper, richer intention of how do we seed something in ourselves that also transmits to place and recognizing that there's a lot going on beyond what we can even understand. And trusting in that as well, I think is part of how we find our way through the complexity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That sounds fun. I get a date. <laughs> <laughs> sounds good. Yeah. Well, you've been listening to Regenerative Risings, Elevating Stories, Activating Change, and I'm the host, Celine Diaris. And with me today has been Nicole Masters, an agroecologist, system thinker, educator, disruptor, and author. And your book is For the Love of Soil, Strategies to Regenerate Our Food Production Systems. And your organization, Integrity Soils, is offering um, actual coaching learning environments for people to come and study and really learn how to help others think this way and, and make meaningful transformation on our beautiful mama planet. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lane. This has been a pleasure to speak with you. Well, thank you. Same. And I'm so grateful.